grisly murder has taken place. Helene de Lombre has crushed her husband André in a hydraulic press, and after initially refusing to explain why and appearing utterly insane, she finally relents to the questioning of André's brother François and the police inspector Charas. She explains that André was working on a scientific experiment involving teleportation, but that something had gone horribly wrong, that André had gotten his molecules mixed with those of a common housefly, turning him into an unimaginable horror. Mutilated and deteriorating mentally, André's only hope was repeating the experiment with the same fly. But when the insect proved impossible to catch, André begged his wife to help him destroy all evidence of his work, and more importantly, to destroy the abomination he had become. With the inspector convinced of Helene's insanity, and Helene all but certain to be put away for life, it is up to Francois to find the escaped fly before the only living remains of André de Lombre are lost forever. Before we get started, please hit that like button, and if you do like this video and want to see more, consider subscribing for more content. I need all the help I can get, so thank you in advance. With that out of the way, let's get back to the topic at hand. With the golden age of science fiction in full swing in the mid to late 1950s, Kurt Newman came across a short story in Playboy magazine called The Fly, written by George Langelin. Newman was a German-American filmmaker who had worked hard during the studio era of Hollywood making low-budget films and 45-minute streamliners, before earning something of a reputation for science fiction with films like Rocketship XM and Kronos. Newman was certain The Fly would make for a great entry in the genre, and an intelligent, subversive take on the kinds of exploitative creature features that were beginning to overwhelm it. He took the story to Robert Lippert, who was the head of Regal Pictures, a subsidiary of 20th Century Fox that specialized in B-pictures. Lippert enthusiastically signed off on the project, and so Newman hired James Clavell to work up a screenplay. Clavell's script followed the short story very closely, with the only significant change involving a less bleak ending. The first draft was excellent, so much so it hardly needed editing before Kurt Newman's The Fly began production, on a budget of $450,000. Despite appearing only in flashback, the main male character of the film is André Delambre, an obsessive scientist who builds a teleportation device in the basement of his expensive home in Montreal. Newman considered Michael Rennie and Rick Jason for the part, but both turned him down due to the fact that the character spends half his truncated time in the film with a blanket over his head. The part ultimately went to Albert David Hedison, a young theater actor who'd recently signed a multi-picture deal with Fox. Credited at the time as Al Hedison, he'd later become more well-known as David Hedison, with The Fly launching a successful career that would include Irwin Allen's The Lost World, the Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea television series, and the recurring role of Felix Leiter in the James Bond films Live and Let Die and License to Kill. Hedison's acting is impressive, infusing the character with enough charm that he doesn't devolve into a stereotypical mad scientist, though the part could easily have been played that way. He is, instead of being a copy of Dr. Jekyll or the Phantom of the Opera, a relatable man whose only mistake is overconfidence, a reluctance to admit that his irrefutable genius is prone to oversights. He has a clear love for his family and his work. Having said that, I don't understand why, after romancing his wife all night and prying her with champagne, he chooses the moment when she is at her happiest and most willing to engage in marital bliss to confess to her that he'd accidentally sent their cat Dandelo to the nether realm. Where Hedison truly stands out, though, is when he begins transforming into the mutated fly monster. He does a lot of amazing acting despite having his head covered and not being able to speak. The scene where he communicates his desperation and his pain to his wife on the chalkboard before scratching out Love You is intense and heartbreaking. Though Hedison is undeniably the film's male lead, The Fly is remembered today as a Vincent Price vehicle, even though Price's Francois is a secondary character who only bookends the film. At the time, Price, who I feel obligated to mention was a native of St. Louis, Missouri, was known as a hard-working character actor not yet tied to the horror genre, he had a few horror roles under his belt, including the title role in The Invisible Man Returns and the mad sculptor Henry Gerard in House of Wax, but it wasn't until The Fly and the following years as The House on Haunted Hill that Vincent Price's name would become synonymous with horror. It's genuinely odd that this is remembered as a Vincent Price movie, and that it helped launch his inextricable connection with horror, as his role in The Fly is neither particularly large nor all that horrifying. 
He plays a relatively ordinary man who happens to be in love with his brother's wife, and who is only tangentially involved in the sordid plot. Don't get me wrong, his performance in the film is good, and I have nothing but love for the man as an actor, but nothing about his work on the fly screams, this man is going to be the next Boris Karloff. No, it is actually Patricia Owens who delivers the standout performance that should be most remembered. I mean no disrespect to Price or Hedison, but Owens' character is the one with the most screen time and the most range to cover. She gets increasingly desperate as events spiral out of control, and when her husband is unmasked, Owens pulls off the Scream Queen shtick admirably. It probably helped that she harbored a deep-seated fear of insects in real life. Rounding out the cast are Herbert Marshall, a war veteran whose acting disguises the fact he's walking around without a right leg, famed child actor Charles Herbert, whose real-life story is far too depressing to relate here, and Kathleen Freeman, a brilliant actress with many notable roles throughout her career, but who is probably most well-known as the nun from the Blues Brothers. Ow! Christ, Jake, take it easy, man. Ow! Ow! Christ. Ow! Jesus Christ. Upon completion of the film's production, Kurt Newman and Robert Lippert screened it for some of the executives at Fox, who loved it so much they decided to release it under the main 20th Century Fox banner and give it a substantial marketing push. Unfortunately, Lippert didn't receive formal credit for producing the film as a result, but the film had much more prestige and financial support as a Fox feature than it ever could have had as a regal one. Tragedy struck before the film's release, however, when Newman's wife died. A few weeks later, after the film's initial selective release but before it went wide, Newman himself died of carbon tetrachloride poisoning. Though it would be reported for years that Newman's death was a suicide, it is possible his death was accidental, that he drank some cleaning fluid thinking it was alcohol, no doubt blinded and confused by his own intense grief. Despite this long-standing controversy, it ultimately doesn't matter if he drank the poison intentionally or not. When someone is that distressed, they aren't thinking clearly. Unfortunately, then, he didn't live long enough to see The Fly become a smash hit, earning somewhere between three and four million dollars. Fox was so pleased with his success, they rushed a sequel into production to be released the following year, Return of the Fly, again starring Vincent Price. Return of the Fly has its charms, but it pales in comparison to its predecessor, with a schlocky script that doesn't make a lot of sense, and a production that wasn't as lovingly assembled. There's a third entry as well, Curse of the Fly, made in 1965, but it wasn't widely available in the U.S. until 2007. So now let's get into some real talk. I hadn't actually seen this movie until very recently, having grown up with the Cronenberg remake and a foolish assumption that the original was a silly B-movie not worth my attention. Like a surprisingly large number of others, I thought 1958's The Fly was a hammer-style, black-and-white, low-budget flick in which Vincent Price becomes a housefly, but that is wrong on almost every level. This is a serious attempt to use a genre that was quickly devolving into schlock to say something intelligent. It deals with heavy subject matter like euthanasia, and refuses to get pinned down by sci-fi horror conventions that could have easily undermined it. It has some really disturbing moments, which I'm sure were even more disturbing to 1950s audiences, and a few core themes that are pretty unsettling. This is a movie about technological progress and the increasing speed at which it seems to be coming at us. Catching up with it is like trying to catch a fly, and if we aren't careful, it can cause the worst kinds of disaster. Granted, the short story carries through with its unforgiving views on the matter with Helene committing suicide in the end, but the film manages to pull off a happy-ish ending without sacrificing Langolin's original intent. Modern audiences might be put off by its pace, which is admittedly slow by today's standards, and they might scoff at the eventual reveal of Andre's prosthetic flyhead. But at the time, this film was carried almost entirely by the suspense and lingering dread that permeate every scene. And I'll defend that flyhead is pretty remarkable, especially with how Hedison twitched his neck and wriggled that grotesque proboscis. I wouldn't compare it to the Cronenberg version, I'll get to that next time, but if it were done today, it would probably be made with unconvincing CG that wouldn't be as good. Also, they probably wouldn't use a real hydraulic press for this sequence, like they did in 1958. It's easier to get a panicked performance out of your actors if they are forced to put all their trust in a press operator a few feet away. Regardless, this is a movie that deserves your attention, if, like me, you haven't gotten around to checking it out. It stands apart from goofy late 50s creature features as a special entry in the sci-fi horror canon, as an almost off-kilter Hitchcock murder mystery that whiplashes you into a universal monster movie, with shades of both psychological horror and early body horror. It's a great film, 
and one I'm ashamed to have wasted so much of my life having not seen. But I don't know if I can forgive them for what they do to poor Dandelo. And that's all for today, my fellow Earthlings. If you haven't done so already, please leave a like and subscribe to the channel. For more science fiction reviews in both film and literature, be sure to check out my website at emcgill.com. If you want to support what I do even more, head on over to my Patreon, where you can find bonus videos, polls, instant reviews of current movies, early access to future videos, and much more. Until next time, when I'll get to talk about the great Jeff Goldblum, this is The Unapologetic Geek, telling you to never be ashamed of what you love, as long as you're not hurting it.